hi everybody. Um, I hope you hear me well. Um, so um, today my my talk is going um, to be a kind of a, kind of a reflection of the work that I've been doing over the last uh, kind of uh, 30 years of work in in, um, in multi-core uh, computing. I've been doing I've done a lot of that, and then the last seven or eight years in which I've been really involved in computational neurobiology in, a, in an area called connectomics. And what I'd like to do in this talk is kind of, um, kind of fuse ideas from both of these areas, from neurobiology and from um, multi-core computing, and kind of challenge maybe the, you know, the way we are uh, designing the hardware and software for machine learning today. Okay, so that's going to be the, the kind of, uh, you know, the direction I'm going with in this talk. Um, and so with that, um, let me, mm -hmm. what's happened now? Okay, do you see the, uh, the slides that should have changed? Yeah. yeah. So you're looking at a, you know, you're looking at a, um, at a slide um, and most of you can recognize immediately that this is Mount Fuji. And you do that in about a hundredth of a second, okay? So a hundredth of a second is a very, very short time and yet you manage to actually, your brain manages to actually identify exactly what, what you're seeing here. You can also tell there's a tree in the corner, et cetera, et cetera, right? And how do you do that? Well, you do it with your neural tissue. So there is this computing uh, infrastructure in your brain that enables you to do this, right? And what is this infrastructure? Well. It's a kind of um, a chemical mechanism, okay? A relatively slow chemical mechanism that is based on neurons, right? Individual cells called, called neurons, and a lot of them, right? Your cortex has about around 18 billion of these. Your whole brain may be around 80 or 100 billion. And so what are these neurons? So um, a typical neuron, if you can follow my cursor here, right, has a dendritic uh, arbor, Okay, it has an axon that ends with axonal arbors, and then it has a kind of myelin sheet around quite a few uh, of the um, axons in quite a few of the cells. And so the, the computation that a neuron does really, right, starts at these synapses. These are connections, these are chemical connections that are along the dendrite, and I'll show you them in a, in a, in a bit, okay? And similar um, kind of uh, ac um, synapses on the uh, axons. Now, the dendrite collects signals, okay, from all of the from all the synapses, and it's kind of the what, what's created is an electric charge that is then kind of summed up. I say kind of because it's not we don't exactly know what the what the measure is for the how it actually collects this uh, this kind of uh, um, you know uh, collection of of inputs from different um, directions, but these electrical inputs are then summed, and there's some kind of thresholding mechanism that once it passes a threshold, fires down along the axon. So if you reach the thresh threshold, it fires along the axon, and then down the axonal arbors to the synapses, and these synapses now will send signals to the next set, neurons and so on. So the synapse, right, that connects these um, cells is extremely small. Connectomics, the field that I work in, okay, is, is actually the field of mapping the connectivity of neural tissue at the level of these tiny synapses. Each synapse is essentially a chemical uh, kind of connector. So you have these kind of uh, vesicles full of neurotransmitters, and when an electrical pulse comes down the axon, it releases the uh, neurotransmitters that are received at the other end on the dendrites of another cell, and those cause a pulse down that cell and so on and so forth. So it's an extremely slow mechanism, okay? And um, and so, you know, when we look at this, at, at this kind of mechanics of your brain, okay, 
um, it's, it's, it's really amazing to, to try to understand what it does, but it's also been extremely complicated. We've been doing this for more than 100 years, and we still don't understand a lot about how brains work. And why is this? Well, part of the reason, and this is uh, the one that I'd like to show you here, part of the reason is just the sheer kind of, uh, you know, size of, this, of, of the mechanics of this system. Right, so if you look at, a, this is an image of a brain, right? We probably, a lot of you might know, you know, that in the brain there are regions, right? Vision region, planning region, balance region. And, you know, at that level, the level of an fMRI machine, you've probably seen pictures of, of these, you know, regions lighting up in the, FM, in the MRI machine, right? And, and that's, you know, and, and that's the kind of view that we have of a functioning um, brain. But really, if we want to dig a little bit deeper, if we go, let's say, 10x deeper, okay, and we look at, at um, you know, at something that is a tenth of the size of, of your brain, okay, then what do you see there? Well, what you see is a region of gray matter and a region of white matter. The gray matter are the cells, okay, the cell bodies of the neurons that we talked about. And the white matter are essentially the, the myelin, it's the myelin that covers the axons that go across your brain. So the inside of your brain, a lot of it is just axons going across, okay? While the outer side are the, are the actual cells. If we go 10x deeper into a region in the gray matter of your brain, okay? Then what you might see is a pyramidal neuron, not the whole neuron, not the axon, okay? But the whole kind of uh, you know, the, the dendrites. Okay, so here are the dendrites of, an, of a pyramidal neuron in your brain. Okay, and the axon would go somewhere across your brain, we don't know where. And if you went another 10x deep, okay, then, you know, what we would see are dendritic um, spines on a dendritic arbor. So this is an, a dendritic arbor, and these little tiny things, we call them spines. Right? And if I go another 10x, okay, now I'm at the 10 uh, micron resolution, okay, what do I see? Well, this is a, actually an electron microscopy image of what um, a slice through a brain would look like at that resolution. Here is a dendritic spine, a slice through a dendritic spine. And here is an axon terminal, okay? So you see these little round things are the vesicles. And so you have the axon terminal with the vesicles and the uh, dendrite with the synaptic kind of, uh, with, with the spine. And then there is a synaptic connection between them and the axon will fire into the dendrite, okay? And that's how we communicate in the brain. Now, you know, I'm showing you this at the, with electron microscopy, and my research is actually done with electron microscopy because of the kind of resolution that we need in order to actually see synapses. You can't really see the connectivity of synapses with a light microscope. And so we really need to use an electron microscope. And so in this electron microscope, you know, if an fMRI, um, you know, image is, is, you know, each pixel is a cubic millimeter. And what, I've, what I'm showing you, right, right, in a cubic millimeter, right, th what I'm showing you a pixel of this uh, electron microscopy image is essentially 10,000 trillion times smaller, okay? So th this is the resolution that we need to get, okay? Now, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, you have to really kind of look really deep inside at the very tiny folds of your brain to kind of start to understand what's going on, okay? Now, by the way, this is not new, okay? So, so the idea of looking at neurons has been around for more than 100 years, okay? So uh, originally, right, neurons were kind of stained with, with this um, chemical uh, called black reaction in, invented by Camilo Golgi, okay? And the guy that uh, kind of mapped these out first was called uh, Anton, uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. And Cajal, okay, was the first one to actually map these neurons accurately, 
Okay, and you here you see an example of one of Cajal's maps. And his idea was, okay, at the time, Golgi and others thought that the, you know, that your neurons, your whole brain was one big connected spaghetti cell, okay? Cajal actually realized just from looking at these images, okay, that what we have here are individual cells and that in each such individual cell, there is actually a pulse that is being sent down along the axon. He deduced this from those images that you saw with the light microscope, which is kind of a crazy idea, okay? Now, you know, and, and surprisingly, you know, he did this, you know, you know with very, um, you know, kind of little, um, you know, uh, ability to actually test his hypothesis. Um, you know, both of them, Kahal and Golgi, won the Nobel Prize for this work. Um, and Golgi spent the whole Nobel Prize lecture explaining why Cajal was wrong and it was one big cell. Now, what happened is that we had to wait till the 1950s, actually, when people actually looked at these neurons with electron microscopes to understand that Golgi was, that um, Cajal was right. And so why is it that I'm showing you this? Well, because these images, okay, are images of sparse reconstructions. In this image, you can see four neurons, okay? But really in an image, in a slice of the brain of that size, there would be an enormous number of neurons, okay? So how do we get at this, at the dense reconstruction of the brain? Well, you know, what we do is this, you know, we take a, we take a, a, a piece of uh, tissue and embed it in plastic. And here it is right here, this piece of, tissue, and we run it with a microtome that goes up and down on a, on a, on a knife, diamond knife sitting on a pool of water, and these slices are kind of, you know, float on the water and are picked up on a piece of tape, okay? So that what we have is essentially brain on tape, okay? So we collect the, these slices of brain on tape, Okay, here is a, uh, the microscope that we use. Um, this is my colleague, Jeff uh, Lichtman. This, uh, this image is supposed to show you how small Jeff is. Um, and so with this microscope, with 61 parallel beams, we can run through quickly, run through these images. And what do they look like? Well, we put this, you know, these little tiny slivers of brain on, um, on a wafer and run it through the microscope. And each one of these little things is a slice of brain. If I looked at it, you know, with a light microscope, it would look like this, okay? And if I, you know, looked at all of them together, right, all these slices that, like, that, that I collect, right, then I could create, for example, a block, right? If I could reconstruct this, I would be reconstructing a block of brain. This example is a 100 terabyte block of uh, thalamus, okay, 10,000 slices. Now, this slice of thalamus, okay, where you see all these cells in it, right, this thing, okay, is just the size of a grain of salt, okay? So 100 terabytes for a tiny little sliver like this, and in fact, if you wanted to do a cubic millimeter, like one pixel of an fMRI, it's about two petabytes of data, okay? Two petabytes of data, coming at you, you know, off the micro, you know, off the, the microtome into the microscope. Now, once we reconstruct, okay, these images, what do we see? Well, reconstruction means going through the slices and actually identifying each neuron, okay? And we've invented algorithms for this, and this is the kind of stuff that my research does. I invent machine learning algorithms for actually tracking neurons and reconstructing them. Okay, and here's an example of the execution of, of one of our algorithms, right, which is tracking a tiny axon um, through uh, slices and slices upon slices of tissue. So you're watching it go deeper and deeper through the slices, the same way that a human would if he was doing it by hand. You see in red the, the membranes and in, in, in blue is the, or purple is the axon that we're tracking, okay? And, you know, this, this process requires executing machine learning algorithms at incredible speeds, okay? So again, just imagine two petabytes of data coming at you at half a terabyte an hour and you have to run ML on it, okay? But if you can, if you manage to do this, you can see beautiful things, 
Okay, so for example, here we see, you know, um, two dendritic arbors. Okay, here's one in red and one in uh, in uh, green, right? And each one of these uh, things is a uh, you know is is a, um, is one synapse essentially, one connection over here. Okay, one spine like that is essentially connecting uh, to another another neuron. And okay, but but in this volume, okay, when you see this little these two tiny slices of of dendrites, what else is there? Okay, this is you know if this was Kahal doing this, he would probably see one of these two uh, dendrites. But we want to see everything that's in there. Okay, so for example, here are all the other den dendrites wrapping those two dendrites. Okay, you see it peeking out from here, or these right. So un wrapping around them are all these other dendrites and also all of these axons all of these axons are going through this volume okay and all the glia cells okay so the whole thing this whole block okay has an enormous number of neurons okay for example in a cubic millimeter the cubic millimeter that is the size of an fmri um, pixel there are about a hundred thousand neurons okay and about a billion uh, synapses okay so it 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 seems to be extremely dense okay so this by the way is a hundred thousandth of the of a terabyte of a grain of salt what you're seeing here okay so um so I guess what I'm showing you is how dense and complex our brain is. And, and this density and this complexity, okay, has essentially led people to kind of um, create a, you know, a, a perception of what the world of machine learning is going to have to look like if we are going to replicate brains in silicon, okay? So if we want to replicate this kind of crazy, dense behaving machine, okay, that can identify, you know, images of Mount Fuji in a tenth of a second, what is it going to look like in silicon, okay? So, you know, it, it's essentially led to, to a, a, you know, a plethora of, of, of machine learning hardware and software. And, and this hardware and software, okay, um, you know, what does it look like? Well, it belongs to the class which we call throughput computing. Essentially, GPUs, TPUs, um, Intel, NNP, Habana. There are about 70 startups and big companies that are making this special hardware for running machine learning, okay? The GPU is the typical hardware device for doing that. A typical GPU has thousands of cores, right? And it has, um, you know, 16 to 32 gigs of high bandwidth memory, memory that is actually connected to these thousands of cores. And, you know, the way we run machine learning algorithms, you know, on these, on these GPUs is essentially to take, you know, take the image, um, bring it into the, you know, the memory, bring the, um, bring the, uh, machine learning model into the memory and then run the computation on it. And what we're running, you know, is essentially we're applying 100 tera, tera ops of uh, computation onto this to kind of make this computation go through at a reasonable speed, okay? And this is kind of the paradigm that we are applying today to run machine learning. Now, you know, when we want to actually make, you know, scale this thing up, right, then here is Google's, um, you know, kind of uh, TPU pod, right? It's 100 petaflops of machine learning power, according to Google, right? This view of a brain is I take, you know, hundreds of GPUs and I connect, or TPUs, and I connect them together, I cool them with water, and I make them run. 
okay? And that's gonna be the future of making, you know, brain equivalent computation because the brain, right, as we view it, right, is so dense and so, you know, has so much compute that there's no hope, you know, and every day there are papers about how much compute we're gonna need to, to do what brains do. Okay, so, so, so basically, I guess the rest of my talk now is going to be a trying to understand really Okay, kind of do a back of the envelope um, computation and try to understand really, is this really true? If this view that I showed you of the brains that we are trying to understand really applies, okay, to the brains that are being built in silica, okay? And so, so I wanna first think about compute, okay? So if I wanna think about the brain, you know, as I think about neural networks, that is, you know, each neuron is a computing device that does a computation, collecting data from other neurons and, and applying an operation to it, okay? So with this simple model, this simple understanding of, of what a brain is, okay? Um, you know, the human cortex is about 16 billion neurons, okay? And a cortical neuron will spike, you know, about 0.16 times per second, okay? Now, um, this is this is from energy considerations, and you know. So if you think about that, and you think about the fact that we kind of know that each neuron has about seven thousand synapses, okay. So you can estimate that there are you know maybe seven hundred or seventy connections per neuron. We don't really know how many there are because we can't. We haven't yet you know, dissected a full brain at the resolution of an electron microscope. That is still years into the future. Um, but, but, you know, connectomics can help us, okay? So here is an image from, you know, an electron microscopy image of, you know, again, an apical dendrite in green, an axon that is going by near it, and five synapses between them in yellow, okay? So what you can see here is that, you know, typically if an axon is passing by a dendrite, it connects to it in more than one place, okay? So in fact, um, if you look at, you know, if, if, if we wanna do a calculation and I have 7,000 synapses, I probably have no more than 70 connections to other neurons that I'm computing. It's just that there's a, a bunch of synapses doing that connection but let's just say 700. So even with the assumption that there are 700 other neurons, then I take 16 billion times 0.16 per second times 700 uh, uh, connections that I'm summing up with from other guys. It's about 2 trillion operations, okay? 2 trillion operations is less than an iPhone, okay? It's less than a modern iPhone. So, you know, the cortex really, okay, in terms of compute, okay, is about five to six magnitudes less compute than the TPU pod, okay? Let's, let's keep that in mind. Five to six orders of magnitude less computation, okay? Now, if you wanna think about image recognition like Mount Fuji that we saw, right? So a typical neural network, ResNet and so on, right? We'll take a 224 by 224 image, which is about, you know, 0.05 million pixel, um, pixels, right? And it takes about 20 to 30 billion operations to compute, right, on let's say ResNet, okay? So the human iris is about 100 million pixels. So 2000 X more pixels, right? And so if I just do the calculation, right, a neural network running on, you know, the image that, you know, the kind of resolution that my eye does, right, would take about 40 trillion operations, okay? If I wanted to use it to, to identify that image, 40 trillion operations, okay? Now we recognize an image in 13 milliseconds, okay? One hundredth of a second, right? And so, you know, even if I use the whole cortex to do this identification, right? Two trillion times, you know, 13 milliseconds is about 20 billion operations per image, okay? So my cortex identifies Mount Fuji in 20 billion operations at most, okay? Probably less, but at most 20 billion operations, while the neural network would take 40 trillion, 
okay? So I guess, again, our brain is three to four orders of magnitude more efficient in image classification as an example. Now, you know, what about memory size, okay? Well, the human cortex has about 300 trillion synapses, okay? And, you know, the graph, okay, to represent these 300 trillion, this 300 trillion, uh, you know, graph is about, you know, about a petabyte, okay? So, by the way, just, just as a comment, right, you know, it's, there are 300 trillion synapses, but remember, each neuron is connected to about 70 or 700 of the, you know, 18 uh, billion neurons there. So it is, you know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of neurons passing by each other and a lot of, syn of synapses and a lot of density in the image that I showed you, right? But the graph itself is extremely sparse. Okay, it's a very sparse graph. And yet it takes about a petabyte to represent it, okay? So the typical memory, okay, of a GPU or TPU is about, you know, 16, 32. I think the new NVIDIA GPUs are 40 gigs. So what we're talking about, right, is something that is ridiculously smaller than the memory of a desktop, right? A modern desktop can have, you know, more than a terabyte, right? And so... If you think about your, your brain, right, the GPU, TPU pod, okay, the memory on that thing is four to five orders of magnitude too small, okay? So it's too small to, to, to hold the graph of a cortex, okay, of a human cortex. So if I want to think of our brain in silicon, what we're building is this, you know, we're building... 5,000 cores on 16 to 32 gigs of memory, okay, right? So essentially it is, you know, a, a kind of a petaflop of compute, a petaflop of compute on, you know, a cell phone of memory. That's what I'm building, okay? But what I want, what, what we need, right, to, to, to do a brain is a cell phone of compute on a petabyte of memory. Okay, and this is where this is where there's a, there's an, an incredible divergence. Okay, um, and so I guess my point is, you know, we've got to rethink what we're doing because the truth might not be that we need a cell phone of compute on a petabyte of memory, but somewhere in the middle between the petabyte of compute on a cell phone of memory and the, you know, petabyte of memory with a cell phone of compute that our brains are, somewhere between them is what we need to build. And it's definitely not, okay, a TPU pod, okay? So, you know, why is it that we're building something that is not the right thing? Why are we building the wrong thing, okay? Well, because we don't know the graph, okay? We don't know the graph, okay? And, and let me just go back to this. We don't know the graph and what we do in computer science when we don't know something, every time there is a new area that we don't know how the algorithms, what we do is we throw compute at it, okay? And this is no different than anything else that we've done in the history of computer science. Because we don't know the algorithms, we throw compute at it, okay? But we're learning. We're kind of starting to learn where the graph is. So here is an example from the work of guys at Google from May 2019. I don't know how many of you have heard of efficient nets, right? So here is a graph you see here the, you know, the, along the x-axis, the number of parameters in a neural network, along the y-axis, the accuracy, right? And what you see is the blue line is kind of the, the top curve of what can be, um, uh, what could be achieved going from anywhere from mobile net to the ResNet to the, you know, ResNex and then Amoeba net, okay? And here is, you know, efficient net, a much more efficient, okay, less compute representation of a neural network, okay? And, you know, efficient at B0, okay, is the size of mobile net, but the accuracy of ResNet, which is here, okay? So with much less parameters, it's doing exactly what this ResNet network is doing, okay? This is the accuracy of ResNet, okay? 
and you know and um, if you look at um, you know at efficient b4 it is the size of resnet but it gives you the accuracy of amoeba net okay so what we're kind of seeing right is this idea that as we learn how to uh, make the networks more efficient right we can actually um, you know we can actually deliver the same accuracy for a lot less compute and I want to show you some some performance graphs um, you know this is on uh, on AWS using the uh, runtime uh, the CPU based runtime of neural magic my uh, startup company it's uh, FP32 right and um, what we're seeing here on the left are batch size one numbers and on the right batch size 64 for efficient at B0, okay? And you can see this is the GPU, the V100 GPU at $3 an hour. Um, by the way, I'm using Amazon prices to give you a feel of efficiency because, right, instead of saying how much, you know, um, how much compute, how many uh, computations per watt I do and how much the GPU costs, et cetera, et cetera. It's all amort uh, kind of um, calculated into the price on, on Amazon. So a V100 GPU that costs $3, you know, um, at batch size one is less effective than a four core CPU when I am running efficient net. Okay, a 34 cent four core CPU. If I go to batch size 64, you can see that a 24 core is beating it for $2. And you can see that if I actually take on Amazon for the same price of $3, I take, you know, the equivalent, which is about nine four cores, I can double the performance, more than double the performance of, of, the, uh, of the V100 GPU, right? And, you know, if you go to a bigger ResNet size network, like a uh, you know, uh, efficient at B4, you can see that a 24 core batch size one beats the GPU and a 24 core is not quite the same, but still ballparking it. And definitely if I just take the same cost of CPUs, I can get to the same performance. Okay. So kind of this is saying, okay, if I kind of know what the graph is, okay, then I can run, you know, I can run the, net, the networks at the same cost with all, without all that computation. Now, okay, wh what am I really, what am I really trying to say as a meta view of this? Okay, so I gave a couple of examples that clearly not showing the whole gamut of what you can do with neural networks or what you can do with GPUs and so on and so forth. But here is, here is my point, okay? Silicon doesn't need to imitate, okay, the same parallelism in the brain. We have this idea and we're told all the time that machine learning is a throughput computing problem and we need therefore a lot of parallelism, okay? Well, here's the thing, okay? Why is our brain so parallel? Well, you know, when you have neurons with very slow, you know, chemical connections and you need to do a billion instructions per second with this very slow medium, then you need a billion neurons to fire in parallel to do a billion instruction, okay? Because they're really slow, okay? But a modern processor, okay, sequentially will do tens of billions of instructions per second, right? So, you know, these computations, it's, th these are Turing computations. These are like Turing machines. It doesn't matter if I bring the flops sequentially or in parallel, as long as I execute it, I'm done in a certain amount of time. That's all it takes. And so there isn't really a need for parallelism here. Okay. Now I'm, I'm, I'm saying this at a very high level. I'll get a little bit, I'll dig a little bit deeper in a second, but that's one idea. Flops are flops are flops. Okay. But there is stuff that we can learn from neural tissue, not the parallelism, okay, but other things. One is sparsity, okay? Neural tissue, as I said before, is extremely sparse, okay? If you're connected, if you have 7,000 synapses and there are, you know, 18 billion other neurons, you're not connected to almost anybody. It's not fully connected. It's not even, you know, it doesn't even look very much like a convolutional neural network. It may, it may be in some, uh, a remote sense, right? But the other thing that neural tissue has, apart from sparsity, okay, is locality of reference. A neuron fires into its neighboring neuron, into its neighboring neuron, into its neighboring neuron, okay? 
What we need, okay, is essentially to build, you know, computing devices that utilize, you know, locality of reference. Okay. So the question is, how do you mimic this in, 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 in hardware and software? Sparsity and locality of reference, right? So, you know, I'm going to say, look, today, the best way we can do this is on a CPU. There are companies, by the way, making memories where you take control of, I think even a startup that is co collaborating with Samsung, if not mistaken, um, what are they called? Neural, neural, neural something. Um, let me think. Uh, Neuroblade. I think they work with Samsung. And, and Neuroblade, they try, they're trying to take over the memory controller, okay, of Samsung memories, okay, in order to run, you know, in, close to the memory. And that's a direction. That's a direction to go. So rather than have endless number of flops on a small memory, let's take over the memory controller and make that run, right? And there are other approaches. Okay, but the idea for today, where most of our computing infrastructure is still CPUs, is that we can still make this infrastructure, make use of the same ideas that neural tissue has, okay? So let me explain what I mean by that, okay? So here, you know, you can see uh, on the left, a, a schematic of a neural network and a hardware accelerator, you know, thousands of cores, each of them tiny cores, each of them doing small computations and having, you know, tiny caches. And on the right is a CPU, right? With very large, powerful cores, each of them with a huge amount of cache memory, right? And, you know, a slow bandwidth to memory. So the bandwidth to memory of the GPU is very high, about 10x that of the CPU, okay? So lots of bandwidth to memory here, no bandwidth to memory here, you know, large caches, tiny caches, okay? So, okay, so once upon a time, right, people notice, oh, look at this neural network, right? What I can do is I can execute it synchronously layer by layer, right? This is what happened 10 years ago. Somebody did that. And because the code was so good for running, you know, in this mode, right? Utilizing the fact that the GPU has a lot of parallelism, if a lot of compute, if you manage to parallelize this, right? So what you do is, you bring a layer into memory, compute, spill it out, bring a layer into memory, compute, spill it out. You have a lot of bandwidth to memory and you're in great shape, right? So that's great. Now, um, if you try to do this kind of computation that, that runs extremely fast on a GPU, okay? If you tried to do that on a CPU, right? You would essentially hit the memory uh, slowness of the CPU, right? It doesn't have a lot of bandwidth. Okay, so if you're writing, you know, computing a layer, bringing it in, computing, bringing it out, bringing it in, bringing it out, you're dead on arrival. Okay, has nothing to do with compute. It's just got to do with the reads and writes from memory. Okay. And this is why the myth was created. The myth of the GPU, right? As, as GPUs can run machine learning, CPUs are slow. Okay, they don't have enough computation. They don't have enough parallelism. That's not the issue, okay? So the fact that the CPU works poorly doesn't mean you can't change the algorithm on the CPU, okay? And that's what neural magic does, okay? So the way you can make a CPU do exactly what a, what a GPU does and better even sometimes, right, is as follows. First of all, you can prune the network, okay? And we don't do a lot of pruning right now. We definitely don't do pruning of neural networks for, for performance right now. We do pruning to get the model size down, okay? So it'll fit on a cell phone. But we don't do pruning to get the computation down. But we can, okay? Neural networks can be pruned to a high ratio and pr preserving, you know, the accuracy to within 1%. And often, you know, there are even cases where pruning actually increases accuracy, okay? So you prune the network. Now the computation has gone down, okay? So now you have the same problem that you had before. Now you have little computation, a lot of memory movement, and you're memory bound. And so because this, the CPU is bad in executing memory bound computations, oops, we're back in trouble, right? But here you can invent another idea, and this is again what neural magic does. What we do is we actually execute, okay, the 
computation depth-wise. So instead of running it layer by layer, we actually know how to break the computation of a neural network into, into kind of um, uh, chunks or columns, if you want to call them, that run inside the cores of the CPU. And these are large, sorry, inside the caches of the CPU. And CPUs have large caches. So we managed to keep those computations in the CPU cache. And by doing that, we eliminate the reads and the writes from memory, and therefore everything becomes really fast. Okay? So you can do that. This is using essentially sparsity and locality of reference. And when you do that, here's what you get. Here's an example of ResNet 50 sparsified, you know, to 87.5. It's a 1% accuracy loss, actually less um, than 1%, right? And here's what you get, okay? So a 24-core Intel CPU that costs $2 is almost twice the performance of, of a, you know, a V100 GPU, okay, in batch one. And in batch, uh, you know, in batch 64, Right? It's a little less, but if you just take the, you know, uh, and execute nine instances of it, you will be better than the GPU, okay? So, and actually today, these numbers are a little old. Today, it actually, uh, neural magic software gets to the GPU speed of 1,000 on a 24 core. So, what I guess I'm saying is, look, you know, sparsity and locality of reference put together can actually deliver, you know, the same kind of performance that GPUs can. Okay, and here are some more examples of this. Batch 64, you know, on, on a, a variety of models, okay, um, you know, versus um, other software that runs on CPU like OpenVINO and, um, um, sorry, like OpenVINO and uh, Intel TensorFlow, that's uh, MKLDNN essentially, right? Um, and in green, you can see the T4 GPU Right, so that's an example. Um, 64, batch 64 on, uh, on AMD, similar kind of thing, right? And, um, you know, batch 480, a huge batch, like GPUs love, right? And what you can see is, it's funny, but, you know, um, a, ba a 480 batch, right, what happens is it actually blows out of the the TPU's memory, because TPU's are memory limited. In fact, this is a reminder to us, right, that the big advantage that CPU's have, right, is that they are much closer to the petabyte of memory on a cell phone of compute, right, than the GPU's are, okay? Because GPU's are typically 16 to 32 gigs of, of sorry, megabytes of, of uh, sorry, gigs of memory, whereas, uh, you know, uh, uh, any multi-core that you buy, any desktop that you buy, you can put a teraflop of, of memory on it. Now, um, now, this brings me to, you know, to the future, as I see it, you know, of, of neural hardware, okay? You know, as I, as I said, today I believe you can use the large caches and large cache hierarchy and cache hierarchy of CPUs you know, to run neural networks at GPU speeds. And this is going to be more and more true as we move to large models like the natural language models, okay, that people are, want to run now. These models are extremely sparsifiable, okay, and have an enormous memory footprint. So everything about them says CPU, 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 rather than run it on a GPU or another accelerator, okay? So that's one thing, right? Um, you know, but tomorrow, okay, and I don't yet know how to do this, but I'm, I'm suggesting, right, is that we figure out how to do what I would call a prefetch brain. You know, today, you know, we, we, we do prefetching in our processors, right? So when I want to compute something, right, I think, of, I think of my computation as always being kind of done on a, on a, on a, on a vector, right? It's essentially done on an array. Right? And so what I typically do is if I'm computing on a certain part of an array, my machine will probably prefetch the next few cache lines to bring in that array. Right? And that's a nice way to do prefetching for most of the computation that we are interested in doing on CPUs today. But if I'm building something that will uh, work on brains, then I think we need to figure out a prefetching scheme that will be more graph oriented. So essentially, instead of bringing things as if I'm running on, a, on an array, let's bring it in 
as if it's based on a graph. And we have to invent those algorithms, but if we actually mimic them in hardware, we will get the locality of reference that we need to build better machine learning algorithms. And of course, the most important thing perhaps is that we need to learn the graph. And this is where I, I find my work in neurobiology, this is where I'm, I'm headed. So I really believe that even though the graph is not in, by itself is not enough, that we can actually learn a lot if we actually see what the graphs in brains look like, okay? What the computation in brains looks like. And we can learn from that, you know, how to actually build a better kind of, you know, neural network, a better kind of thinking uh, hardware machine, hardware software machine. So with that, I'm going to say um, thank you.